the way I said I'm Ron Rainey. I'm an economist, so my background is in uh, business planning, marketing, business analysis, and uh, I'm going to focus more so on direct marketing strategies during this marketing session. But just by a show of hands, how many of you are or work with growers that are primarily focused on direct marketing, being direct to consumer? What about uh, commercial, going to the wholesale, to a DC or a distribution center or a, a restaurant? Okay. Well, uh, hopefully, I will share some 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 strategies, some ideas that can help you in those avenues. But this is just kind of like a shotgun approach to marketing. But the thing is, when you're talking about marketing, there's no cookie cutter approach, and it comes down to who you are as a grower. What's your what we call what's your comparative advantage, and that's a combination of your experience, your location, who you're trying to market to. And what is it that your target customers, that is the, the, the main customer, if you were gonna give your, your your general customer a face, what your customer wants. And so the thing is trying to think through some strategies to help you uh, recognize what that is. And I'll start out with a little, I'll, I'll try not to be too academic in terms of just talking from textbook stuff, but whatever they talk about marketing from a, a, a business class or a business planning deal, they always talk about the four P's of marketing. And I'm just going to put them all up here to talk about it in that kind of a space. The four P's of marketing are product, place, price, and promotion. And there's a specific marketing strategy within each one of these four P's. Within each one, if you're selecting your products, you're actually designating your marketing approach. And for example, if you're trying to select an organic product or a non-GM product, or a natural product, then you're actually kind of laying out a marketing strategy saying, my product is different and this is how it's different. So, so you can actually select your product, your marketing strategy by the product that you use. You could try to get a product that, that uh, will yield early in the market, will hit what we call that marketing window. You can be early in that marketing window or late in that marketing window. And if you have a product that's early in that market window, that product or that variety that you use is part of your marketing plan. So think through some of those things that you think, uh, a great example is, is tomatoes. Nationally, Arkansas's tomato crop hits the market early. Uh, well, it's right after the Florida, but it's before the other, other imports start coming in. And so it's got a great brand recognition across from, the, from, I'd say, from Canada down to south, across the Midwest, and they go over to the east a little bit. But they, they developed that through some nice varieties that we have here that ship well and taste well. So the very pro specific product can be a marketing thing. Uh, I won't talk too much about place, but place is the method you use or the market that you're going to, the channel that you're going to utilize. Since primarily I'm going to focus on direct marketing. <coughs> price, uh, looking at your price, and it's something I'd encourage in uh, trying to get some more resources because I used to do cost of production for fruits and vegetables and I had a strawberry budget, but I haven't done one in about 10 years. Because uh, I put on a number of other hats and lost my technician, so I'm like, well, oh, I can't get that time to get it developed. But we're trying to get resources to come out with some updated budgets or cost estimates so that you as a grower can under understand what is the minimum cost that I can accept and still stay in business. And as a grower, that's something to think about. From the marketing perspective, uh, if you're a smaller grower, you don't want to compete on price because uh, someone asked earlier, well, how does California do it with their huge facility? Well, they compete more so on volume. And so if you, if you sell, well, I'll, give, I'll go to the commodity side to give a good example. Uh, the soybean producers, they make their profits on pennies on the bushel because they're marketing probably a million bushels. So imagine that volume that they can they can make their profit on half a cent or a quarter of a cent. Well, if you're only uh, marketing, you know, 20,000 pounds or whatever it is you're marketing, 5,000 pounds, then you don't want to be considered just to compete on price alone. But the price that you use, there are people that, that, that focus their marketing strategy completely on price. There's a company up in Northwest Arkansas that, that one of their slogans, low price leader. Uh, anybody know that company? Big retailer. <laughs> Walmart. But but the thing about Walmart, is, is Walmart known, is, is their reputation based on high quality or having the best 
the most exclusive <laughs> product. No, no, their 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 deal is that they are a a a volume discounter. So they make their profit by selling a lot of volume, and they make their profits just on a little bit. But as growers, it's really difficult unless you have substantial acres uh, uh, to to compete on price, and it, it also is very difficult if you're in the specialty crop space to compete on price because. Uh, if you got one or two other growers in the area and you keep undercutting your price, in the end, the farmers are going to lose out. You're both going to lose and the consumer's going to win and you're going to end up just barely making a profit or maybe even losing money to capture markets. So understand what your cost of production and, and try not to compete on price and I'll talk about things about relationship marketing and, and telling the customer about uh, your things uh, that, that differentiate your products and your farm. And the last one is the one that we primarily talk, think about when we think about marketing, and that's promotion. Standard promotion, which is what you're doing to communicate to your customer about your product, place, price of your product. And I'm going to talk a little bit on these, but just want to give you that just as a, as a framework that you can talk about that. If you look in business plans, they may talk about what's, what's your marketing plan. Typically, they're talking about the four P's of marketing. If you address each one of those to, to a financial institution or, or or any type of a, of a business, then they, they can kind of put it in that framework. But I'm also going to talk about strategy a little bit, just to think about, because I'm talking about direct marketing strategy. And so competitive strategy is about being different. Uh, if you're in a competitive market, you know, we always talk about that the pure form of competition is two gas stations directly across the street from each other. And, and, and their pure competition, and primarily, if their main their main business is selling gas, when the customers come down, this is the highway, they're going to look and they're going to see what's the price per gallon, and that's going to determine where they go. That's pure competition. So what you see is you see these gas stations doing things different. They might one may put a Subway store or McDonald's in there. They might have offer a whole variety of of, of whatever types of, of different types of items for sale to make it a one stop shop that you can get a host of other things other than just gas. Or they may make it more convenient about how you can come in there to, to pay for it. But there's different things, and, and that's the competitive strategy of thinking through how can I be different from the other farmers without competing on price is the thing that I want to stress, stress for direct marketing farmers. Also think a little bit, as I go through some of these strategies, think about strategy in terms of the creation of your position, your, your, your market position, if you will. And even if you're a vendor at a, mar a farmer's market, you have a market for uh, you have other vendors that are that are your competitors, but you don't want to compete on price if you're a smaller farmer. You want to compete on your reputation. You want to compete on your quality of your product. You want to compete on, on your customer satisfaction or your follow-up. And you can compete in different ways about how do you gather people to your booth in terms of, of your display and, and how you present it. Different things that strategy kind of getting outside, but also applicable in the direct marketing thing, especially with online resources, is, is the activities that we do. How do we buy? How do we sell? How do we even produce our products? And how we look at being competitive, having strategies within those various spaces. And uh, then lastly, talking about strategy, is strategy is equally concerned about choosing what not to do. You know what they say, if, if you're a jack of all trades, then you're a master of none. And one of the things you want to do about being a competitive, having your competitive advantage, is, is really specialize and have that expertise in, in either one product line or, or a specific product line, or, or within a specific market channel, be a very uh, outstanding at customer relationships or building relationships at your at your farm stand, or have a wonderful brochure that you've linked that you're bringing people onto your farm through agri tourism or you're doing stuff through farm and school where you have a strategy where you're talking about the, the history or the, of, of your longevity within the sector, you're a fourth generation farmer. Or you have a pristine location and you're trying to get people out there so you tie everything in to your pristine view and, and you bring people out to your farm for an experience, more so than the product. But just think about what you wanna do, but also think about some things that you don't wanna do or maybe you don't have an advantage there. Uh, and I promise this is my last slide talking about just generic, regardless of farm, there's four P's of marketing, and regardless of what industry you're in, there's, there's basic strategies for growing profits or growing that business. You're either serving existing uh, uh, markets or you're serving new markets. 
you're either serving existing products that you've already grown or you're serving new products and services. And then the, the last one, so if you're not in either market or pro product development, then you're in related diversification. You're using some combination of, of serving existing markets, but I'm gonna try some new varieties, try some new product lines, and you're gonna diversify. And you're always gonna do it from a strategy of, of what, what am I good at? What, what's a, a, a natural fit or what's a, the minimal investment for me to take to enter that space, if you will. But if you are looking at just getting into your market, getting more shares of your current market, that's what the market penetration uh, strategy is. If you're just trying to capture more of your market space, then you have to do some things that really stand out to highlight how are you different from your competitors in the marketplace. And again, I, I stress that try to identify ways other than price or identify technology and identify ways that maybe you can you can have a lower price, but that's not your, your standard bearer for getting your customers saying that I'll give you a better price. And lastly, in terms of developing strategy, we talk about a competitive advantage. And the, and the term competitive advantage just always means that something that you're just a little bit better, you have an advantage versus your other competitors. And that may be location. If you're in Arkansas and you're close to an urban center, like you're close to a Fayetteville or outside of Little Rock, you have huge population centers that you can capture versus being in a rural location where you have to go to your customers. And so think about some of those things that you have a natural advantage for as far as uh, uh, your, your farm. That's an advantage if you're in a rural area is that maybe you can expand your acreage or your production in a, in a less costly manner versus your landlock possibly or maybe uh, uh, have to deal with some zoning issues if you want to expand if you're in a more urban area or close to an urban area. So just want to talk a little bit about marketing strategies just from a broad perspective of looking at those historic, you know, either market penetration, uh, new products, uh, services, or new customers or related diversification. And the thing of, of where it is now is that, um, I'm not gonna say it's a whole new world out there in terms of marketing, but we are overwhelmed, customers, the standard customers overwhelmed with marketing messages. You know, we're sitting there, we're drinking bottled water in this room. <clears throat> Costs more than a gallon of gasoline. <laughs> you know, and, and, and that's the message. And, and I know people that, that will look and, and, and will get into, they will only drink certain types of bottles. And that's, that's the marketing message. And that's just one product area. We think about the internet. We think about uh, brands. I'm marketing my university right here with this brand. All the different ways that we uh, have done marketing in the past, the, uh, the internet and, and smartphones have really changed that whole dynamic because you can do it in a less costly way. But there's some things you can do that are innovative that, can, that you can do as effective as, as a Walmart. You know, I was watching the news this morning and they were interviewing, uh, and I'm sorry because I'm kind of old, there was a young singer and she was talking about how she had 91 friends on Facebook, 91 million friends on Facebook. And she says, you know, I, I really don't know how I do it, but she said, I've got 90, uh, uh, Shakira, is that right? <laughs> she, goes, <laughs> she goes, I've got 91 million friends and I don't know how I do it because I just go out and I post every so often, but I try to do stuff that's interesting. But she's got 91 million people following her, an artist, a music artist. And, and uh, how many companies would like to have 91 million followers? <laughs> I mean, and that's, that's basically a free tool for farmers to use to connect with various groups, uh, to, to showcase your products. I got a success story with one of our tools. But the thing that, that wasn't available in these past deals, it overly emphasized the who that you were directing your activities toward and the type of the form of information that you share. Uh, today, I think that, that that's kind of a wide open game. I mean, you can kind of make your own rules, if you will, as long as they're legal, but you can make your own rules. <laughs> uh, and the thing is, 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 is to raise awareness. Um, it, it's amazing, there's, there's a group of kids, and I forget their name, you may know them, in Kansas State that, that just promote ag, and they just started doing these videos. They were farm workers, uh, FFA kids. And they started making these videos where they're out rapping on the farm while they're driving a tractor. And they're hilarious, and they've got a huge following. And, and beyond the marketing for their parents, for their farm, these kids are going all over the country speaking about ag and how important ag is to them. And I'm sorry, I forget their name. I watch them a lot because I, I love to pull up just to showcase how many, how many different things you can do. I can remember doing crazy stuff as a kid. If we had a video camera, I could have 
or my brother, my siblings could. I was shy quiet. My siblings could have done some really mar some phenomenal marketing. But just think of those things. And the thing I like to talk about with smartphones, smartphones, smartphones and, and online technology is it's a wonderful avenue to engage your kids in your farm business. <coughs> it's a wonderful avenue. I, and I tell the story, it makes me nervous. I was messing with my iPad one day and, and my daughter, it's my workout pad, but I put a few of her games on there. Don't tell my boss. <laughs> <laughs> she's, like, she's like, Daddy, uh, can I play my, my puzzle game? And I said, okay, give me a minute. Let me find the password. She goes, okay, I, I can figure it out. And I'm like, sure, sure. So I said, here, I'll be there in five minutes. And she looks at me and says, Daddy, watch this. She's seven, mommy. She's seven. <laughs> She gets my iPad, she turns it on, puts in my security code, and looks at me and smiles. I said, she said, you didn't think I knew that, did you? I said, no. She said, I know all your passwords. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's, it's a wonderful way to engage your kids. Uh, think about if you're a farm, it, think about uh, the response. If, if you were to go to some of your teenage kids and say, hey, come up with a flyer for my farm, a PDF flyer that I can post online, or that I can send out if I'm a CSA or if I'm a farmer's market customer, that I can lay on my table. Th think how engaged they will, because first they, they may say, they may be able to do it, they may say, well, well, what do you do? What do you do? You know, and just to get those questions. I, my daughter was asking, I was showing us pictures when I was growing up, she's seven, and uh, and she said, I was, we had a video because my mom had, at the time, we just called them chickens, but at, just today they would be called free range chickens. <laughs> and so we had chicken that we would go get eggs. She's like, oh, okay. So you were a farmer. Grandma was a farmer. I said, yeah, I guess she was. She said, well, what did she do with the farm? I said, still there. She said, well, I've never seen any chickens. I've never seen a cow. Never seen. I said, well, I guess we sold all the livestock. But it would be wonderful to engage her in that conversation to understand that's agriculture. And here's the thing. Even in a rural state like Arkansas, you'd be amazed at where people think that their milk comes from the grocery store. Eggs come from Walmart, and uh, and uh, and it's uh, it's potential for you to educate. It's also potential for you to gain customers because I think that uh, there's a potential marketing opportunity, and I think also that ag suffers. Am I being recorded? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say I think that ag, <laughs> I think that ag faces criticisms because sometimes we allow people who aren't familiar with ag to tell our story. Exactly. And I think that we should tell our story. And if we told our story more versus letting people that have no familiarity or connection with that to tell our story, then we would have a higher credibility. And, and I think just the basic conversation would change the frame the framework of that discussion. So, and, and again, I think that uh, the internet has given us farmers that capacity to do it in a very uh, uh, cost-effective manner. And, and it's not even uh, that much time. And I, I'm just going, I know I'm probably getting a little long-winded, but there's, consumers crave that type of information. A friend of mine in Alabama said there's a Whole Foods store that put up a camera in the store in Birmingham. And it is a live feed of a farm that supplies that store. So farmers in Birmingham walk by this camera and they can see, and it's got the products that they bought from that farm. So see how the products that are coming to this store are being produced. And the consumers love it. And they're trying to explore ways to do it in a cost-effective way to put up more of those cameras because that interactive nature uh, will let consumers, one, it's education, it's, it allows them to experience it, but they want to, they want to understand, they want to connect. And, and it's a uh, potential for ag, I think, to really connect and do some really, uh, uh, capture customers and supporters and advocates. So the thing I'd, I'd add is don't assume that your customers will know about what makes your product special. Don't assume that they'll know uh, what, what what makes your product better. Yes, sir. Can I, can I throw something in on that? Sure. I was just out in Arizona and you know there's a lot of grains now coming out of greenhouse hydroponic production. Mm -hmm. And the neatest thing I, as a work person, I sat there going, They just, you know, pull out with the roots, snip a little, but they just redesign their clamshell so they can stick that in the bag with roots. And you know what they said on the bag? It's the freshest you can possibly get because it's still alive. Wow. The price <laughs> was 50% more than the same green sitting in a bag right there. And it was gold. I mean, they're selling, you know. And it's because you're saying, 
that word special, and that's it. And, and consumers want to experience that special. They want to experience it. Yes, ma'am. We have a regional store called Resource. It's out of Tulala, Oklahoma. That's it's a grocery store, and they do that same thing when we post. They have a video running right next to the meat, yeah. beef cattle oh, wow. industry, and it's nice. And, and, and it's powerful. I, and, and I'll say this, whether I'm recording, I have a brother who grew up in my same household, and he, 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 well, he, he's educated. He's a very smart guy. But he he loves to come home and debate me and, and, and sit down and wants me to watch these films like like Super Size Me or Food Inc. And say, tell me the real story about egg. I said, well, you grew up with egg. He said, no, no, tell me about all all these companies. And he, and, and they take this stuff, and his friends, they take this. He was on the East Coast for a while. So they take this religiously, and some of it is just myths. Uh, it's not found in fact, and some of it, I think, is is intentional marketing to, to attack ag in many ways. That's just, that's not the universe art. That's Ron Rainey. So I'll get, I'll get off that for long. But the, the thing I want to highlight is that you must tell your customers, and you must repeat your message. So things that you can do to repeat your message, even in rural even in rural areas, I think it's important because those changing dynamics, uh, it's really, uh, um, it's changing. So make sure that you are capturing and meeting the needs of your customers' desires for experiences and knowledge. I mean, that whole idea, like this is fresh, as fresh as it can be, right? It's still alive. Think about the, the genius of that marketing deal. The thing that you can do to connect with some of your customers. And the thing is, is your customer, if you're at a farmer's market, your customer is a customer coming right up there. If you're selling to a Walmart distribution center, your customer is that Walmart buyer. Ultimately, it's, it's the consumer, but you've got to convince that Walmart buyer that you've got the product that's going to meet the needs of what their thinks that their consumer is telling them. So just just uh, use some of your resources and, and, your, and, and try to, uh, to, to engage who your customer is and who your consumer is. In terms of marketing, think beyond beyond the whole idea of promotion. I mean, some of the basic stuff of promotion, like branding of your farm name, putting a logo on your products, or having a farm brochure, and, and having a consistent message that resonates, because you want your message to repeat. And, and I've said this before, but you know, I love strawberries, but you don't want people to go and just want to buy the strawberries at peak season right now. You don't want them to just go and look, well, I need to get some strawberries now. You want them, One, you want them to go and start saying, well, to know that Arkansas season is primarily in the month of May, so I want them to go get Arkansas strawberries. But then you want them to go get Ron Rainey's Northern Conway County strawberries because they're the biggest, the sweetest, freshest berries around. Uh, they're the farmer who started a new slogan because one of the quote-unquote competitors said that he had the, the sweetest berries in the state. Well, he came out with his slogan is, he said, I'm not going to say they're the sweetest berry, but there's none sweeter. <laughs> and you got a picture of a beautiful, his granddaughter right there, holding up a big berry with some big strawberry red cheeks. And just think about that picture and how that resonates and connects. But he goes a step further because this farmer delivers in the Walmart DC. He'll go to that local store manager and say, okay, when you put my berries out, I want you to put this picture out, this poster out. I also want you to put some little shortcakes over here and put some little whipped cream over here so we can help move those berries. Because that produce manager in that Walmart store, uh, before he started, uh, or she started selling and buying the berries, they may have been buying and selling toilet paper because that's how the distribution system works. Uh, those buyers lack an understanding of what agriculture is. Uh, I was working with a group and they wanted to come, they were coming to Arkansas in, in uh, December and they said, Make sure you take us to an area. We want to see fields full of ripe, ripe red tomatoes. This is December 15th, ever come. <laughs> ripe red tomatoes. <laughs> and, so, and so there's a disconnect. So there's always these opportunities. But, but think about the collection of activities in terms of marketing beyond just the branding. How do you do your message? Uh, and also focusing in and, and, and targeting in on who your customer is. Thinking strategically. Uh, and this is where I highlight the, the relationship marketing. Uh, to build those relationships, and I'm in Fayetteville, and I know it's Janet Bach, uh, Janet uh, Bachman, over at the farmers market. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I go out to the farmers market with her one morning, and she's got her product all backed up, and she's selling out real rapidly one morning. But then she's got some product back here, and I said, she said, "Oh, I'm about to sell out." And I said, "Well, you got all this stuff back here. Are you, you need me to help you put it out?" She goes, "No." She said, "Those are my other customers." I said, "What other customers?" She said, "Well." 
I've got some customers that they're not going to get it to start, but I'll save them some product back and they'll they'll come by and I'll have something for them. To me, that's relationship marketing because she wants to take care of those customers that are going to come to the Fayetteville Farmers Market, but they're not going to come and look for tomatoes or peppers or, or, or bell peppers. They're going to come to look for Janet and look for her stand. And they're going to be a repeat customer. And, the, and there's a phrase out there in the market that says the, the best way to, to double, to, to find a new customer is to satisfy your existing customer. The, most, the best investment in marketing is to satisfy your existing company, customer. Uh, take advantage of opportunities and trends that exist in the marketplace. I'm going to talk a little bit about local. Uh, and something that I think that uh, I'm really excited that the Ag Department is really putting some, I would say some teeth being some hard dollars in promotion of Arkansas grown and Arkansas is a specialty crop state that can produce specialty products. Uh, they've got their, their logo, the Arkansas grown logo. Have, how many people are familiar with that Arkansas grown logo? That, that logo in the past has been free to use. They're coming out at one avenue that they're trying to increase promotion of it. They're coming out with a, a, a feed for, it's still free if you just want to say I want to use it and you, you re reproduce the, the brand. Uh, which you're uh, paying for the printing. But you pay $25 and they'll give you so many price cards, so many labels, and a poster. And you'll be registered with them. But it, it's, a, it's like a little promotion basket, a little promotion bundle. And, and they've got different levels. But the other thing that's exciting is that they're doing that with restaurants and, and retail outlets. They're having them register to educate them on what Arkansas Grown is, different ways they can use that signage to promote Arkansas Grown in their various uh, retail outlets. So state branding program is one, and they will go outside the state's borders to promote Arkansas Grown as well. Uh, there's some state directories. Uh, I'm gonna talk about um, Market Maker, which is a directory that we have online. Arkansas Grown has one, and Farm Bureau has one, but we all collectively get together to launch a local and grown. Uh, uh, Basically, it's going to be a, an online marketing resource, but what's really exciting about Local and Grown is that it is a mobile app. You know, I have a director, it's an online director that farmers, you farmers can go in and register to. Arkansas Grown, you can go in and register and be registered, but none of us are talking directly to consumers. With the mobile app, uh, Joe Public will go out and put in their email address or their cell phone number and say, I want to get this app, this mobile app to find farms, and they're going to focus on Farms that sell from farmers market, they'll have farmers markets registered. Farms that have a CSA or, or have their own farm stand. But what we'll do then, if it was launched right now, which I'm sad that it's not, but if it was out right now, we will be able to push, do what they call push technology. We would send a text out and said, strawberry season in Arkansas is in peak now. Go and, go and find, uh, use this uh, app to find local berries that are fresh. We would do it again start of, 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 uh, of June when tomato season hits in Arkansas. And we would actually start to educate consumers about what's fresh and what's local. Uh, that's going to be a, available full, 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 full launch, I would say, by next year. Hopefully we're going to get it out this summer before all our crops are, uh, come to harvest. We're having a meeting here in the next two weeks. But though, some opportunities get plugged into all of those. And people say, well, can I, you know, can I saturate my name by being listed too many places? And I, and I always say, as long as you're consistent in how you're listed, uh, you know, use the same username and password for all these different places so you don't forget. And, and to me, it, 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 it doesn't matter whether I find you on Market Maker or Arkansas Grown or Farm Bureau Best Pick, as long as I find you. And when I find you, whatever you put on those websites to say that you're going to deliver, that your product and your service delivers. And those are the most important things. So, and, and the host of these resources are free. That's the thing that I highlight. And I throw this up here. It says, this may not be, if you've seen me, I, I use this slide a lot. So this may not be a profitable business, but one must consider the intangible benefits such as lifestyle that one enjoys. You know, they're having a rough day. It's raining. It looks like they went and got this cast. But the thing that's important is that think about when you're talking to someone, whether it's with the Ag Department or Farm Bureau or university, that you talk about what are your goals, what is it you want with your farm. As an economist, I might come and say, well, you need to hire two more people, you need to double your production. And without any understanding that you just want to have a part-time business. Or that may be your goal is to expand as you want to capture some retail markets. And so have those discussions, but also think uh, clearly about where it is that you want to, you want to grow your business. 
there are a number of farms that, that, that exist just because they want to give their, historically, they wanted to give their kids a summer and a part-time job, or they wanted them to be connected or teaching that work ethic. But, but I think also that there's growing, and I, and I heard some sentiment early, there's growing market opportunity for viable full-time businesses with the technology like Hoop Houses, with the, with the demand in local that I think that there's enough of a consumer surge, if you will, that you can sell products and produce products uh, beyond uh, an extended season that you can uh, generate some substantial uh, income in the part-time. So, And your goals don't have to be rigid or a, a booklet. Uh, uh, I love this, I uh, was reading this book, and I'm, I'm sorry I forgot the title of it, John C. Maxwell, uh, but he was talking about the importance of goals. He said, the purpose of goals is to focus your attention and give you direction. It's not to identify a final destination. So if you're trying to evaluate whether or not this was a good goal or not, his statement, and I, which I agree, is whether or not that goal gave you direction, whether or not you wanted to invest in that, that uh, new technology, whether you wanted to invest in that new variety. So think about uh, your goals that you have for your business. As long as they're giving you direction, I mean, they can change, but you want you want to be able to uh, to have that direction. Um, and so now I'm going to go more into some of the traditional direct marketing opportunities. How much time do I have? I'm 15 minutes, right? 15. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll get there. Talk about traditional, and you can think beyond these because. What's even interesting is that even with a large retail like Walmart, they have a, a local procurement deal that you can go directly into a local store and, and contact the produce manager and say, I don't want to deliver into a distribution center, I just want to deliver directly to this one single store. And they have an avenue for that, if you're interested. Uh, steel would probably be sizable uh, volume. Uh, I know that Whole Foods, well, you can deliver to Whole Foods to a single store. And was that right that the Whole Foods is coming to Northwest Arkansas? Interesting. Good. So they know us. So, so saying, yeah. <laughs> so, and so, and then, you know, traditional, more traditional, uh, basic is farm sand, you pick operations, and CSAs, which is uh, a wonderful avenue, even in some of the rural areas, but it's, it's nice to be able to go into a population center if you're going to do a CSA as your direct marketing. Uh, talking about the trend, and I've been saying this for a while because it's, it's still it's still very very strong. This, this, this consumers are demanding local, and it's for a host of reasons. Uh, uh, and consumers are becoming more sophisticated in understanding. They're looking at what the label. Where, where was this wrong? How was this wrong? Uh, is this certified organic? Is this and whatever and it has meaning to different consumers? Is this a corporate farm? Is this a family farm? All these terms have different meanings to various consumers because there's folks out there talking about it and there's a company that I think has done a wonderful marketing job and that's Chipotle in terms of talking about how they use local farms and when you buy products from them they're buying products from local farmers and uh, the university research shows that when a consumer uses the term local it means many different things to them. Everything from non-corporate to organic to, to small family farm. And, and all they see is the term local. And so, but again, that's an opportunity to, to, to think through some of the way that you connect with your customers. Uh, more grocery stores, restaurants, and other retail food establishments are trying to feature foods that are identified as locally grown and processed. Last year, we had a Southern Arkansas tomato farmer supply all of the Subway stores with Arkansas buying rice and tomatoes for the month of June. A phenomenal story. <laughs> uh, but and, and what's interesting is that with this one farmer did that, I was like, he produces that much tomato. <laughs> one farmer did that. Uh, what's really exciting is that Subway was so excited because their sales increased. And, and what's really exciting to me was also, within those Subway stores, they put that Arkansas Grown Loco uh, logo in the various stores. It, buying a ripe and Arkansas grown tomatoes and had Arkansas grown in there. And so consumers were saying, oh, I didn't know we produced tomatoes in Arkansas. Consumers were a little wrong. <laughs> For on that scale, you know. But that that story, that local sourcing effort was featured uh, in January of this year in, in uh, Miami. I tried to get them to let me go to that meeting. <laughs> it was featured with, with that Arkansas farm. <laughs> but but the, the, the gist of it is that locally grown, here it is, every Subway store, and that was 400 stores in Arkansas, 
had Arkansas grown. So now consumers may look for those tomatoes. I, I went to a few of the stores and just asked consumers, and they were like, oh, so yeah, I can taste the difference in the tomato. And, and it would have been wonderful had I had the foresight to go and actually do a survey and talk to them about the taste difference of their perception to really have some more than just anecdotal. I could say, well, look at this survey that I got uh, and took it to Subway to tell them some of those things. But that potential is there. Uh, Subway noticed that their sales uh, kind of, they got a little bump with that in terms of sales. And, and they were just ecstatic and are looking to expand in other states and expand it to other uh, products because the thing that they're able to deliver is that fresher uh, flavor profile with those tomatoes that are able to vine ripen into them. Large commercial distributors and processors are developing processes to accommodate local producers. Again, that, that, that deal was facilitated by Del Monte's involvement. And Del Monte's looking to do that uh, all across the Southeast. Feature local procurement because he said it saves them money because instead of getting a shipment of tomatoes from California and shipping them over here, it comes up to Arkansas. Now the system is the system. I found it interesting that those tomatoes went from South Arkansas to Dallas back to Little Rock. <laughs> but that's the system. <laughs> but that's the system. But that's better than those tomatoes coming from Florida or California or Mexico into Dallas and then to Little Rock. And I think there's potential to, 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 re to recognize that because the host of reasons. One, because consumers are demanding. As I mentioned earlier about the, the water demand in some of the other producing areas and, and just the potential uh, uh, risk of, of, of sourcing all of your product from one specific area. Companies are trying to uh, to, uh, to to address that, and, and the most is because consumers are demanding it. Uh, the current supply chain visibility to local and regional sources. They're looking at developing new local and regional sources uh, all the time. You'd, you'd be amazed at the number of conversations I have. Uh, they're struggling trying to figure out how to do it because it's got to fit within their existing system if they're going to do it in a large scale way. But I think to let it grow organically and just let the small successes uh, of how do we grow this? Well, you start from uh, serving the folk farmers market to serving maybe one uh, mom and pop grocer or maybe one restaurant or maybe one school. And you kind of start trying to use that as success to say, you know, maybe I can do farm to school or maybe I can do farm to institution. Go into the uh, uh, we have farmers that are selling to the Air Force Base in Little Rock. Uh, try and identify those various market segments that they can put together the whole crop. And I use the term, well not the whole crop, I say you want to sell the whole cow. So you don't want to sell your whole strawberry crop to one vendor, one supplier. You want to say I'm going to sell 20% here and I'm going to sell 25% here. And maybe I'm going to get a, a premium on 30%, I'm going to go to a subscale restaurant and get a higher price. And so think about some of those things as far as you lay out your marketing deal. I also look for some opportunities for some of the ethnic uh, niches that may uh, that may be developing. Uh, there's actually investment. I'm working on a project that uh, Walmart Foundation is funded where they're trying to reinvigorate historic growing areas uh, to grow some popular uh, U.S. Uh, uh, items to reduce their transportation costs to, to deliver a fresher product, also uh, to, to uh, reduce imports. Uh, uh, there's also a host of reasons for local, from safety and quality perceptions, um, uh, the freshness, uh, the taste, that fresh profile, and then that home bias, uh, supporting local businesses, uh, supporting uh, the environment in a more sustainable way that is more environmentally, economical, and socially sustainable manner. And consumers get satisfaction and willing to pay a premium if they feel that they're meeting that, that uh, those qualities. Again, uh, they're, they're, they're willing to pay a premium for these local products. Uh, and producers are doing a better job of developing marketing strategies and demanding a bigger piece of this pie uh, in terms of trying to get a, a, a higher price premium for some of these uh, 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 buyers, if you will. And it's because those buyers recognize that there's profitability. Uh, C.H. Robinson, one of the largest uh, procurement firms in the country, they, they, they did a, some analysis of greens a few years ago, uh, Southern Greens, and they said, it, you know, it, it, it adds dollars to their bottom line because not only if they, if they sourced it locally, they, they saved on transportation costs. If they did a, a system where they branded it and marketed it in the store, it stayed on the shelf shorter periods of time, so they reduced spoilage, and they turned over their shelf space quicker. 
because they took the product off the shelf in, a few, in two fewer days and they were able to, to put another product on it that sold. They, they, their, their spoil is reduced. They increase profitability of that product line. And so they recognized that and said, well, we need to expand the shelf space. And that's everything to retail. <coughs> it's turnover and shelf space. It's how do you generate the, the profit on that. And here's a consolidator uh, procurement firm that said that it, it's, it's, uh, it's profitable to do this. It's a profit strategy. Beyond being environmentally, socially uh, sustainable, it was economically sustainable. So, and 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 again, the, the changes in fuel prices, it, uh, fuel prices, it uh, it kind of it what doesn't eliminate, but it kind of minimizes that that risk uh, fluctuation that businesses face. Um, this is the Arkansas Grown uh, logo. If you hadn't been familiar with it, um, Arkansas is also in the process of getting ready to release an Arkansas made logo. So, if you produce ag products. That you that are or, or value-added products that are made with Arkansas products, then they'll have a separate Arkansas made logo that some manufacturers are looking looking for, like different uh, types of cheeses and, and, and butter and, and candles and, and a host of value-added products that they're looking to expand this uh, Arkansas brand. Uh, made in Oklahoma, uh, Alabama is buying fresh by local, Mississippi made by Mississippi. But all, all of these are state branding uh, logos, so they're free to use for farmers from those states. And and what that, what happens is, I know I as a university for Arkansas Grown, I do some free promotional advertising for Arkansas Grown across the state and across the country. Because I'll show this when I go talk to buyers, whether it's Del Monte or whether it's C.H. Robinson, I'm like, how many of your suppliers do you use as Arkansas Grown? I know that uh, the Ag Department will go to the Produce Marketing Association and they have a huge trade show where they're trying to recruit buyers to Arkansas to come and source products from here. So uh, there's some ways to leverage some of those resources uh, into the state. Uh, cooperate versus competing. Uh, other local producers are not your competition directly. I, I say that in the sense of if you're looking at price alone because oftentimes I hear that farmers are just competing on price. I can give you a better price and I'd encourage you to seek ways, I mean, it's okay to compete on price if you're doing it from, I'm using new technology, I, I can produce my product in a cheaper way, but don't drive yourself or your competitor out of business, your fellow farmer out of business just by going to a lower price and then say, well, I'm going to sustain myself after I drive them out of business because I think that's, uh, that's, a, that's a hard strategy to be successful at. And, and, and the only way to do it if you're competing on price is to get bigger. Uh, cooperation, just some things to say, because we're a small state, uh, uh, it helps reduce the risk by helping build those synergies within an area, builds the expertise uh, that the university can invest in getting, whether it's a vegetable or a fruit specialist, in terms of if we've got enough viable farmers, then they say we need to add some more resources to that. You know, if we have enough specialty crop farmers, then maybe it wouldn't be an issue for me to say, I need a program associate to do nothing but specialty crop budgets. So those are the things that come about, and just throw that in there as well for the uh, because there's a grant out, the special crop block grant is out there. If you get it, fill out the census of ag because that's what those dollars are based on. The the dollars that our ag department is able to allocate back out to our industry is based on the size of our, our industry. So it's important that we get those get a, a a good representation because that's how the big states they just the richest richer, you know. They have these huge associations that really push getting the numbers in, so they get huge specialty crop block grants in to their state ag departments. But it, but uh, just cooperate helps reduce risk, uh, helps get more resources to help you do some things. And I'll just close out by by just highlighting some different specific strategies that uh, that uh, can can help. Uh, sorry about that. Help uh, think through some marketing strategies. Notice the, notice your own buying strategies. You know. Uh, my wife was going around, and I, I didn't know what it meant. I, I knew, I, she was saying BOGO, BOGO. I'm like, what does BOGO mean? Buy one, get one free. Yeah. It's like something. <laughs> and it's like, uh, and so those little quantity discounts, and so, because and she, she's in retail as well, but she, she used all these acronyms that, that mean nothing to me. I'm like, what does that mean? And she told me, like, oh, well, I said, why don't you say it? She said, oh, you get to understand. But look at different ways, and, and it's a nice little deal, because uh, suppliers will come in. She works at dealers, and they'll come in and they'll say, 
we'll do a promotion. They'll use this little term that just resonates with them immediately and it captures their attention. And so she goes up to her BB and says, look, we got a BOGO special. And it's not as consumer because they're looking at people supplying into them for volume discounts. Think about different innovative and nice ways you can do that, even at your, your farm level. Uh, take an idea that works in one industry and use it in another. Uh, being specific in terms of quantifying your claim, in terms of talking about, again, getting back to maybe that part education uh, and agri-attainment type of a, of a deal if you're talking about the variety or the flavor profile that you have with your various products. Develop an ability to see your, your customer's perspective. Uh, uh, what, are your, what, is, what is your customer buying your product? And you can do that through some different, uh, uh, just very simple feedback from just asking them, you know, how, how are my melons or how, how are my berries? To go into very systematic customer survey types of things. Innovation and systemization where possible, uh, even in ag, there's some different ways to do that in terms of, of buying inputs and also selling your products to help with your marketing strategies. Um, Again, I want to highlight these uh, that these ideas in terms of utilizing resources that the university has for you, and uh, uh, in terms of uh, the ag department, in terms of the University of Arkansas, uh, I think there's a host of free resources out there that can help you uh, streamline or maybe enhance your marketing message. Communicate routinely with your customers to provide information and give them feedback, whether that's one-on-one -on -one or whether it's in some type of a systematic fashion. And uh, your, your strategy should be consistent and linked across your entire business. It's interesting sometimes when I, I, I see two businesses linked, one maybe on Arkansas Grown and one on Market Maker, and, they're, and they're, they're, they're basically telling, giving me a completely different picture. One is I'm a small, I'm a small uh, fourth generation direct marketing farmer come visit my farm, and another one's like, I can be anything to anybody. Tell me what you want and I'll supply it. It's like a mixed message, and so it depends. If, 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 if it's interesting to try to do that, but, but you got the same customers on the same pages that they're getting different messages to. So, so be consistent, especially in the product that you have. Uh, uh, Bill Landis, one of the growers, was like, if you can't be proud, and I, I like to use that because I got a picture later on, but I'm not going to make it to that slide. It says, you can't be proud of the product that you have out there in the marketplace, and you probably shouldn't be, shouldn't be selling. But, uh, Lastly, I'll, I'll have recognize the importance of developing a relationship with your customer on that relationship market. I had some slides on Market Maker. Uh, market Maker is a free online marketing resource. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to call. Uh, so I'm going to skip through all the detail of Market Maker, but basically what it is, it's connecting growers to viable markets. But the thing I want to tell farmers and people that are certain farmers is that it is a free online marketing resource. Basically, the, 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 the snippet of it is, is that it's available in all these states right now. It allows a farmer, because only farms and ag businesses can register. Everybody else will put them out there. But we actually promote farms, ag businesses, farmers markets, wineries, agritourism. They go out there and develop a free business profile and actually list what products that they're selling. Uh, it's, list, it's available in all these states and active right now. By the end of the summer, it's going to be available in all 50 states and probably in the Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. Um, and when it, because a, a new company is coming in, they're investing in it. And maybe, maybe so for you guys as well. They've also got a memorandum with India and they're talking to Brazil because they want to take it worldwide. And so there's potential in many avenues uh, to do some things with, with internet or online marketing. I heard, and I forget the name of it, that is it Amazon Box or Amazon something where you can go, uh, uh, I think Walmart does it. You can fill up a box with whatever, whatever in the box for a set fee, and they'll ship it to you for free. And some, it's, it's, a, it's a link with Amazon, but companies are thinking innovatively about how they can use online uh, technology to deliver products. Even Walmart is doing, they're going to do a, a, a drive-up grocery store where you can order products online before you, before you get there, you drive up and you say, here's my order number, and they'll give you your box and you never have to get out of your car. Mm. To me, the next innovation is how do farmers, because the big, the big farms are going to be tied into these systems, right? To me, the next innovation is how do small farmers tie into those systems because they're going to be consumers that are going to say, 
I guarantee you that I want a local box. I want a box that's, that's 100 miles of where I'm located or 50 miles of where I'm located or that you can guarantee me that it's only been picked within the last three days. Because to me, that's the next innovation. But but I've, I've heard conversations from Walmart to Amazon to Del Monte that they are investing in online technology uh, of how can they reach customers through online. And some of the stuff is, is literally blowing me away how they do it. But none of it, it's, it's talking about how to get into that system. Now, the system I talked about where the tomatoes left, Hamburger, Arkansas went to Dallas and then came back to Little Rock. So they have to figure out how to get into that system. If there's enough of a demand, there could be distribution packing facilities in Harrison, Arkansas, or in Hamburg, Arkansas, that are meeting the needs of some local population centers. And so I'll stop there. No, I'll do this one last one. I'll tell this story about, and this is the benefit of Market Maker. Who can use Market Maker? Anyone with internet access. Uh, in terms of the search, if you grow food, sell food, process food, or eat food, uh, you can use Market Maker. And again, it's, it's available in these states now. It'll be all 50 states, and probably the, uh, many states or, or many countries around the world uh, in the near future. Uh, that's Riverside Research's plan. And and uh, it's an easy way to do product differentiation. Uh, that's the Arkansas Grown brand being featured in uh, the Walmart store up at uh, Rogers. It's called a neighborhood store uh, a few years ago. Uh, and the consumers are seeking this out. And so there's ways for you as local growers to connect in with this. Um, this is Bill Landry. I, I use him as a success story for Market Maker uh, because I don't know, how many, any of y'all know Bill He's in Newport, Arkansas? He's an older farmer. Well, I shouldn't say he's an older farmer. He's been at it for a few years, but I said, Bill, I need to get you on this website. I think the good word. He goes, Ron, I just don't believe in that internet thing. I just don't have time for it. And uh, he said, but if you want to come up and get me, help me get me in, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some time. So we go up, and I also tell him this, that uh, he's one of our most savviest marketers because you go out there, and he'll just go out there and start picking fruit. And, and he'll say taste it or he'll cut open a melon or he'll he'll peel some sweet corn and he'll start telling you what variety it is. He'll tell you why he grows that variety. He's got a different variety of strawberries for a view pick versus what he grows that he sells to, to the retailers. Because the, the fresh one is, is redder, sweeter. The one that he does for the wholesale, he has to put it in that, in that uh, uh, container to ship. And so. Uh, you know, there's different varieties that, that perform differently, but it also has a good flavor profile. But he can sell that to you in the store, in, in, in his field, while he's out there telling you about it. But he registered with Market Maker, and he was spotlighted because uh, he was impressed because he got feedback from a customer. And, and I just put this in there just to talk about this. This is the bottom line about connecting to your customer. He wasn't online anywhere. Uh, he he fills up semi truck loads of strawberries, so he's pretty side of the farmer. We didn't have an online presence, but he was selling all these intermediaries and wholesalers, and uh, he sold some some melons up to a, a distributor that sold uh, some of the watermelons up to Battle Creek, Michigan. And she says, I have bought three of your seeded watermelons at Horrocks, which is a grocery store in Battle Creek, Mich Michigan. They are without a doubt the best I've had in years, and I'll be contacting Horrocks and begging them to be sure they buy from me next year. And that lady followed up. Uh, Bill's response was this, this is the type of, 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 of promotion that farmers need. Um, Bill also had me bring that flyer, that front page of that flyer to him and uh, when we went up and we visited with the, the company up here, the produce company up here in Springdale, Schmet Schmetting Produce, to talk about this story, to highlight the quality of his product and he just did it to help strengthen his relationship with them. And to say that, you know, I've got product going to Michigan and I've got product going in, in the Canada. But he's able to get that feedback, but he wasn't tracking it or, and it just tickled him to death that he was getting this customer feedback. And he said, mm -hmm. I can either look at it or I can't, but at least I have it. And uh, he looked, tell me, he said, you should use another one. He said, he said there was a woman that, that contacted him and complained that his seedless watermelons had seeds in them. She said, she wrote this long letter and said that, that I can't believe that you've got these seeds in there because I can't, I don't want to deal with seeds, but then she said at the bottom, she said, 
but I must admit it was very good. <laughs> <laughs> One of the sweetest melons I've tasted, but she said, you gotta get the seeds out of your seed with melon. But anyway, I'll stop there and take questions. Any questions? Uh, Just yes, make sir. a comment. I, having gone through Cal College, it seems to me, and I think this is almost a rule, that if you're going to be raising livestock or a crop, you do it because you like it. And the weak link is what you're talking about. Some of these people that, that I read into really wanted to sell. Let's put the cows on the truck, go to the auction, and let's hope we get a profit. You don't know what you're gonna sell it for, the auctioneer says, so. And I, I was thinking, the comment about the lettuce, and I was in California, and they, they were selling butter crunch, which at one time, you couldn't find butter crunch lettuce in a store. And the, the, the marketing thing was the clamshell. And these are available to the little guy now. So I don't know how you do it, but the computer, somehow, you can find it. And to, to find your niche, whatever it might be, it's, it's neat. And you should be able to sell, we were making, I was making comments about why would they be selecting strawberries that taste good? This is your sales point. My strawberries aren't that big, they're that big, but taste them. Yeah. And that right there should sell it. And, and, and that, that's so true. Once you do that flavor profile, I don't know, have y'all heard me talk? I don't know if y'all heard me talk before. I love to tell us about my wife. She's a city girl. She's from Little Rock. I thought she was a country girl, but she's a city girl when we were dating. Uh, she noticed that I would eat strawberries all the time, but usually they're around this time because we started dating in May. And so all summer long, she would buy me strawberries. I'd eat a couple of them, I'd throw them away. And she's like, she's like, what's wrong with you? She said, I'm showing my love for you. I'm buying you these fresh strawberries and you're not eating them. See you eat a couple and throw one. I said, well, those those strawberries, this is like in October, November, December, and she's buying me around. And I said, those aren't those aren't fresh strawberries. Those strawberries are from I don't know. They're probably from Mexico. I'm not sure. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, next May comes around, and I go down to the farmers market. I think I went to uh, Jody Hart, and I said, give me some of your. I like mealy fruit really really sweet just too sweet probably but I said give me some of your, your sweetest berries that you picked you go I, I got just some for you give me a box that I mean just just pick fresh off the vine super sweet tastes like candy so I take it on I said here's a vine ripened fresh Arkansas strawberry which is one you should buy in Arkansas man. and she eats it she goes oh my gosh <laughs> she said that tastes like a strawberry and she's sitting there and she's like it even smells like strawberry. I said, that's that's the difference. She's like, and so then she goes, I said, okay, so we eat strawberries at night. And then we get up and she takes the whole thing to work and gives them away. And she comes back, she says, give me some more of those strawberries. And I said, well, I try, but I may not be able to get any just like that. And, it, and it's, it's a disconnect that consumers have, but I think that, that the technology allows us to get into that niche yeah. and tell that story. And if we can deliver that flavor profile, even vendors at Walmart will be hooked when they get that. Uh, the side is Whole Foods is now selling heirloom tomatoes in Little Rock and they're delivering them up by the crates, just a small farmer doing a small level. And the thing that gets me is that if you look at them, they're not what you would expect to see in a retail. They're not the beautiful big red berry. They've got some blemishes on them. They're not all uniform and they're not all of a unique size. But the flavor profile is consistent when you cut it and it tastes like a tomato. Mm -hmm. And that's what Whole Foods is, is delivering on. Yes, ma'am. Since you mentioned that, Amanda Harris is a local food buyer for Texas, Oklahoma, and Arkansas. And she's been working with some of my growers outside of Tulsa. And she'll come to the farm. She looks at the whole farm. She looks at the food security, how they're doing their... She'll walk you through whether or not it's acceptable to Whole Foods. They got very high standards, and she's working with one of our big growers right now. With, and um, I just want to mention that. The other thing is, out of Tulsa, there's a, a fresh market, and they have this logo going that's close as you can get. And then they have several different things as far away, you know, up oh, okay. as, as close as possible to buy, up to 250 miles. So there's places you can sell in Tulsa from here because you're within that 250 mile. 
and, and, and from a sustainability avenue, uh, your market may be, Tulsa may be a, a better market outlet than going to Little Rock because it's closer. Yes, sir. You trigger a thought of it. There's an upscale grocery chain in Tucson, JT, JC, something like that. It's a little upper scale. But, and the way they display their fruits and vegetables are in baskets and bowls, not in those stupid cases. But what you said cracked me up because what they do, instead of just a price, tomato, 89, they write a little description. And one of the tomatoes was an heirloom, and they said, looks really funky, but tastes awesome. <laughs> it, it, I mean, isn't that genius, though? It, 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 let's try that one. It, it, it is. I mean, think about, you know, reality TV is what you find on TV, but everything's about cooking. So people are looking for these unique heirloom, different color uh, uh, lettuce different shapes, different flavor profiles that different uh, foods can deliver. Mm -hmm. And so that's a unique marketing point that I think small growers can deliver on. One of the problems with your heirloom tomatoes is that they, they're susceptible to diseases. Yeah. And what we were, got a blurb on a little while ago was grafting. And a couple of years ago, I found out up in Missouri, you can graft tomatoes. The Chinese have been doing it for millennia okay and you just put a tomato on the bottom that is resistant and you put your heirloom on top and it passes the resistance on you know so you're going to get more heirloom tomatoes well those are some different management things that i think as that market grows